Good evening. I'm Father Russ Carmichael, and this is Street Talk. And we're on live, and I'm probably going to surprise a lot of people uh, to, to, tonight. I have a great guest. I'm going to tell you about my great guest in a minute. Across from me, obviously, is my co-host, Dominic Cotton. He's, he's right here with me. Uh, I want to thank all you people for letting me back in your home for being able to talk to you and uh, hope you're all warm and snuggly after this snowstorm. Uh, the other thing I want to make sure that we say uh, we're really concerned about Andy. Hope Andy, uh, Senator Maynard, is doing well. Uh, we always our prayers for him. I know, we know he's back to work and you're getting his notices over the, uh, over the internet. So, you know, we're saying hi to Andy out there. Um, and uh, later on, uh, okay, we're gonna we're, we've got a special going on uh, later on tonight. We have Senator Osteen, who's who's back with us as always, a great guest for us. But right now, this show I've been waiting to do a long time. Sitting across from me, I have Donald Williams, <laughs> and I am glad to have you yes. here. Okay, <laughs> past president of uh, Senate. Okay, t ten years. Um, ten and a half years. Ten and a half years yeah. in right. the state senate. He uh, well, as president, as president, president. Yeah. Uh, right, yeah. as president of the senate. Excuse me, as president of the senate. But what I'm going to talk about tonight is, for me, one of the best books, and I'm not blowing you smoke at all. I have ever read, and I believe everyone should read this. You know we're doing a lot of shows concerning what's going on racially around the country and everything mm -hmm. else. Historically, every person in Connecticut should read this book. Absolutely. Uh, okay? And I love the way you write. Uh, okay? The detail and the work that went into this. Uh, Prudus Crandall, uh, okay? Well, I'm going to let Dawn explain who it is why he done it, and everything else. But this, I anybody concerned with our social issues that are going on right now should read this book. I have others I want you to read too, but I'm serious. Don, I love the book. Thank you, Russ. I Thank really, you so I much. really, really do. Exactly. Dominic, great to see you. Okay? Yeah. It's a history that uh, most people don't hear about. No. Uh, matter of fact, when I was first elected to the state senate in the early 1990s, uh, I didn't know anything about the Prudence Crandall story. And her schoolhouse is in what used to be my district, the 29th District, Northeastern Connecticut. It's in Canterbury. Um, and for those who don't know, uh, she was a school teacher. Uh, she taught school in the early 1830s. She had a school of her own, which was very unusual for a woman to, woman, to right? own the schoolhouse, right? to run the school, hire the other uh, folks at the school. And it was very successful. And she was teaching the white daughters of right. uh, the folks in and around Wyndham County. And uh, one day, uh, a friend of one of the servants at the school, Mariah Davis, who was black, uh, her friend Sarah Harris, who was also black, asked Prudence Crandall if she could be a student because Sarah wanted to be a school teacher, uh, teach other black children in the future. Prudence Crandall didn't answer right away. Uh, there was no segregation in Connecticut by law, but by social custom, the races went their separate ways for the most part, uh, even in the North at that time. And uh, so when Sarah came back and asked a second time, Prudence Crandall uh, said yes. Uh, the students accepted Sarah mm -hmm. as a, as a uh, student in their classroom, no problem. But when the parents found out, that's when everything broke loose at that point. The, the uh, parents r responded very adversely. The town fathers tried to get Prudence to uh, expel Sarah. Um, and then finally, the state legislature, to its shame, passed a law called the Black Law, the Black law. which prohibited the education of uh, uh, Prudence Crandall's black students there at the school. And what happened was she had to decide whether she would continue to operate uh, and essentially commit an act of civil disobedience or expel Sarah. Well, she kept her school going. She was arrested, put in jail for a night. Um, her trials, Crandall versus State, were the first civil rights trials in the history of the United States. In the US, and they yeah. took place right here in, in uh, Eastern Connecticut. Every lawyer needs to read this. <laughs> 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. Every, every lawyer, right? Every, uh, I mean, this is not, uh, okay, this is a white story 
in the black story. Mm -hmm. and, and, and that's why it's so important. It's the issues that Dominic and I are talking about. Uh, we've been mm -hmm. uh, on the TV. We had uh, Carolyn uh, uh, Vermont on and Dennis. And we're talking about these, these, these issues. Uh, I mean, the history, number one, is so rich. But it's a history that... I didn't know. I, I, mm. I'm educated in Connecticut. You know, been here since, since I've been eight years old. And uh, I've been through the whole school system. And uh, like you, this <laughs> until, until I read this book, this is the first that I've, I've ever heard of uh, Prudence Crandall and, and, and really how it relates to where we are today. And folks all throughout Connecticut were involved in this story. It's a story about, as, as you said, Russ, uh, uh, both white and black folks coming forward, standing up for equality. Mm -hmm. uh, you had certainly Prudence Crandall, uh, William Lloyd Garrison, who was a mm -hmm. white publisher of the most famous anti-slavery newspaper, The Liberator, in mm -hmm. Boston. Uh, you had other folks like the, the Burleigh family, William and, and Charles Burleigh, white anti-slavery activist, Samuel May, mm -hmm. a Unitarian mm -hmm. minister mm -hmm. in, uh, yeah. in, in Brooklyn. These were just some of Prudence Crandall's allies. But then you had Sarah Harris, a young black woman who was standing up uh, for her ideals and her own education. Uh, Mariah Stewart, who wasn't directly involved, but she was arguably one of the first black women activists to stand up yeah. for the rights of, of blacks uh, black. against slavery yeah, and, and pro-education. Exactly. Yeah. David Walker, someone else who was not directly involved, but a black activist leader in Boston who had a tremendous impact on, on William uh, Lloyd Garrison and uh, therefore the anti-slavery movement. He had, had all these folks coming together in Connecticut as well as leaders in, in uh, Boston, New York, Providence, Philadelphia, and so forth. But, but the way it weaves through, especially eastern Connecticut, mm -hmm. up in the northeast, Canterbury, Brooklyn, Wyndham, Norwich, then down to New Haven, Hartford, uh, folks from almost all corners of this state coming together in one way or another as part of this story. Well, because it's education, a lot of people don't know the history of education, how it develops. I, I mean, when you, th this is why these things are so important. This history, basically, uh, uh, what you wrote about, I mean, I take it because of my own studies, expanded the education, how we developed into uh, what, what they uh, into Massachusetts, where sections of Massachusetts developed programs for interracial stuff based on, on, on these educational systems in the law. I mean, you're, we're talking about about mm. how our laws developed and the struggle. And it's, I mean, it's real, what I found so interesting. It really uh, sent us here, okay, in Canterbury and, 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 and developed here. But if you follow it, it goes all the way to Europe. It goes all the way to, I, you, mm -hmm. you know, and back and forth because of all the wonderful characters that you, historically, that you talk about. Each a serious leader in their own right and through that whole development. I mean, you, you know, I, I, I mean, it, it, this... Yeah, this should be a movie. Uh, <laughs> I, 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 re I really am. And, and the tragedy is so many people don't know. Mm, mm. You know, that's our hidden, you know, our hidden past in the shadows and stuff like that, uh, okay, that, that, that is not talked about and, and continues to have a lot of problems if we only understood the rich foundation of how our blacks and whites work together to try to get over this immoral issue of keeping people down, making laws against uh, of them climbing up the ladder of success and, and being accepted in society. So, but you got to be. This is, this, is, this, is, this is such a great book. I well, love this book. Well, thank you. Thank you, Russ. And, you know, one of the things that uh, really captured my interest the more I, I researched this and found out about it was that, yes, it's a, it's a fascinating story about the abolitionist movement, the anti-slavery movement in the 1830s, 40s, 50s, an amazing story about Prudence Crandall's courage and her heroism in uh, educating young black women at a time when she was persecuted and threatened uh, as a result of that. But the more I found out about this and the research, and I realized her story touched directly 
uh, two of the most fateful U.S. Supreme Court cases in our history, the Dred Scott mm -hmm. case, Dred Scott, yeah. which helped lead to the, to the Civil War, where her case was cited for all the wrong reasons, mm -hmm. uh, because of a judge, David Daggett, who said that blacks are not citizens, mm -hmm. um, a, a Connecticut gentleman, by the way, from, from New Haven. But then it, it, her case and the arguments that her attorneys made reaches all the way to 1954, and perhaps the most historic civil rights case in our history, Brown versus Board of Education, which ended segregation, where one of the historians who advised the attorneys for the NAACP in Brown, uh, Howard J. Graham, uh, cited the arguments by Prudence Crandall's attorneys, arguments that argued in favor of black citizenship, in favor of due process uh, for all black citizens. He cited those arguments as the underpinnings for the 14th Amendment, which was the grounds that the Supreme Court used to overrule uh, the, the separate but equal um, standard that had allowed segregation. So that argument helped strike down segregation in our schools, which when you think about it, was what Prudence Crandall was all about. When was she that? admitted Sarah Harris as a black mm -hmm. uh, student into her a uh, classroom of white young women, right. she had at that moment created an integrated classroom. Right. And that's what the town fathers and the state legislature in the 1830s objected to. Yes. It took us 100 plus years to 1954 to get to the point where in this country, under our laws, the Supreme Court finally said, in so many words, you know what, what Prudence Crandall did back then is okay. That should be the this, law of the land. The law of the land and the standard. I, I, I know for me, um, when I, I take a look at, a, 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 and I certainly like to be able to look at things as a whole picture, it's you can really see the pendulum kind of swing uh, backwards and forth uh, with, with, within the story. I mean, um, you know, taking back uh, to, to, to the early days of our, our founding fathers, you know, through through the abolitionist movement, you know, through the Civil War, where you think it's going on an upswing, and then it kind of swings back down through, um, you know, the Jim Crow laws right. and, the, and the 20s until it comes back around to, to Brown versus Board of Ed and starts swinging in the, in the other direction. And, and you can see society kind of uh, grappling with this right. back and forth. You're right. I mean, we forget sometimes that uh, even though virtually every one of the founding fathers uh, said at different times that slavery is terrible mm -hmm. and that we must end it, uh, virtually every founding father owned was slaves. A slave. uh, <laughs> only, jo only John Adams yeah, yeah, right, uh, was, exactly. was someone who, so who did, did not own slaves, right. but George Washington, Benjamin Franklin, Thomas Jefferson, right. Patrick Henry, John Jay, on and on and on were, were slave owners, and they, they were not able to reconcile this unbelievable conflict between Thomas Jefferson on the one, one hand writing in the Declaration of, of Independence that all men are created equal, at the same time mm -hmm. allowing human bondage slavery mm -hmm. in the United States. But uh, you're right, even after the Civil War and after the adoption of the 14th and 15th Amendments, ending slavery, pr providing for due process for all, we saw the end of Reconstruction, the rise of, like you said, the Jim Crow laws. And then there's that uh, picture, that I, I put the photograph in the book in the 1920s. Here is a, Klu Klu a Ku Klux Klan yeah. Yeah. march in Washington, D.C., this picture with the U.S. Capitol, the dome of the Capitol mm -hmm. in the background, and then in the street, just filled with Klansmen and women dressed in their white robes, marching down Pennsylvania Avenue. It, it sort of takes your breath away, and you're reminded, uh, we, we're not a post-racial society. Even today, we have yeah. grappled with these, these issues. Exactly. And in, in the, the light of the grand jury decisions in the Michael Brown case and Eric mm -hmm. Garner, uh, these are still issues that we grapple with. This is, uh, for me, I, I mean, it's a big deal for me. Historically, I, I have a, uh, my ancestors, Scott, relative uh, in the 1700s, uh, anti slavist said no, y y you know, his philosophical thing was no, no man should own uh, another man, it's morally uh, reprehensible and stuff like that come through that, that, that system. And, and of course they obviously were having the struggles in Europe and, and, and everything else to uh, do away with slavery and stuff like that. You, you got slaves when you had wars and stuff like that. So the issue 
the, the hardest place for me to look at is our country has had the worst system of slavery than any other place. And we, it should have been ended and we should have got over this, but for some reason it continues in, in, in insidious ways. Yeah. Uh, okay, that we haven't all as a people grappled with this immoral, it's an immoral situation. And, and the North was complicit. A lot of folks think of, well, you know, that's right. Sla slavery <laughs> was... Seriously. Yeah. 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 Folks will think slavery was terrible, but that was something that South, happened in the yeah. South. Yeah. We, we were all for, for eliminating slavery, and we were all for equality for all in the North. Well, of course that's not true. Of course it is And uh, the, the Northern bankers, and uh, the merchant marine trade, and the insurance folks, and everybody down to the carpenters and blacksmiths, the people who built the, built the ships, uh, and folks who were making rum. Uh, mm -hmm. Everybody was in on was this. In it. And, yeah. and, and we were building the slave ships. We were financing the missions. We were distilling the rum that was then taken to Africa right. uh, to use to, to buy right. the Just, slaves. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and then bringing the slaves back and uh, uh, selling them in Cuba and up and down the coast, beginning, um, of course, in the, in uh, the south. I mean, but, but in the 1700s, <laughs> yeah, right. you're right, in the 1700s, there were slaves right here, right here. Uh, in Connecticut. Right here. Right and we, here. we were one of the last New England states to abolish slavery entirely in 1841. I, of course, I grew up, you grew up in Newton, I learned about Jackson Homestead and the Freedom Trails and all this stuff. You're getting all this mm -hmm. education, which a lot of places didn't teach all of those things, right? But they, they were trying, you know, I can't think of the system that they were using, treat our last kids to integrate and understand stuff. They taught about the Freedom Trail going out, they never taught about the freedom, tr the, the trail going back where bounty hunters and everything else, big paid money to capture people, steal people, kidnap people, and send them down south and sell them. They never talked about that. You had to learn it through, uh, uh, through other ways in, uh, uh, in your older education. Never taught in high school, never, never was told all of that stuff. And uh, just because I was fortunate to have a, a good history Zen, Howard Zen, uh, who was a good history teacher and came from where I, I lived. I learned that y you need to find out about history, Russell. You, you know, it may not be what you think. Uh, and, uh, and, and, and this is why I, I just love this. I mean, this hits on exactly the issues that we were talking about. And we, we have people coming back on that are discussing these present issues and laws mm -hmm. uh, 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 about what, what's going on. You just nobody really talks about it nobody mm. nobody nobody takes the responsibility from the white society that we did a lot of this stuff right here in new mm. england and stuff like that insidious stuff and that people don't even know about the and and, and slaves were black people were invisible my my associates talk about uh, friends my i have a black partner that's been incarcerated a lot, a lot of years up in Walpole. Now, it's no bodies, nobody's dead, but he's, he's, he's incarcerated. And, and he writes about this, this stuff. Uh, and the difference between northern, northern slaves and northern, northern blacks, you had a direct confrontation with them in, uh, in southern okay. blacks. In, in the North, no, because most people didn't even grow up around blacks. They were something else. They, it was not necessarily segregated in this sense, but they had lesser jobs, stuff like that. So your communities were separated. You could say, well, we don't have slaves. Uh, I, we, don't, we don't do that. And the fact was, we, as you just said, economically and stuff like that, in the trades and everything else, it was horrendous what, what, what happened. Uh, you know. Well, you can see the out and out uh, with the abolitionists. How they how they got chased in New York mm, mm. and Philadelphia. They're and race riots. <laughs> race riots. Yeah, yeah, well, yeah. yeah that the fight. Yeah, that people. A lot of people think, oh, well, it's just over. That was over. Well, the Civil War and stuff like that. But with huge race riots, mm. we had huge race riots. People, well, most people don't know know about those things that happened. Yeah, you know. You uh, know, one of the things that that really. Um, impressed me, I think, was that despite the intense discrimination uh, of that era, um, this, despite all of the obstacles that folks like Prudence Crandall faced, um, you had people who were standing up, both 
black and white, and white yeah. um, working together understanding that slavery certainly was wrong, but also that discrimination and prejudice was wrong. It wasn't, wasn't just an anti-slavery movement. That's what it was for some folks. But for Prudence Crandall, William Lloyd Garrison, and her immediate um, um, group of supporters, mostly the folks who taught at the school and worked with her, um, they firmly believed in equality for everyone, well, equal for everybody, rights. Right, right. Uh, and then, of course, Prudence Crandall um, extended that to not only equal rights and equality for all regardless of color, but all regardless of sex, because she uh, became uh, really a, a suffragette toward, toward the end of her life, fighting for all the rights of women, the right to vote. And uh, she saw discrimination against her not only from the point of view of those who objected to her teaching black women, but to those who objected to her as a woman holding a position of leadership, yeah, exactly. uh, owning and running a school. And she wasn't supposed to own anything. You were supposed to have to be a male in those days. And, well, that was, and, that was and the interesting part. If, was, she, if she had been she, married, yeah. it would have been, the school would have been so in her, her husband's, husband's name. name. Right. Yeah, that would have been required right. by common by law. law. Right. The only way she was able to do this was because she was single. So, yeah, yeah. yeah. It, was, it was really amazing how she managed to do that because people were angry. They didn't like that. They, well, they, they went to the father, right? Was it, uh, they went to her father, yeah, Pardon father, Crandall. Father, they right, went to right, her brother, right. Hezekiah. <laughs> they said, you know, hey, pal, talk, get, talk, get, talk, get talk it women out of it. Get her under that's control. A, yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. You know, you, could, you, you sense in the book, that's, that's, you know, you sense in the book, they're driving, get, <laughs> get your daughter straightened up. Right. I, I thought about trying to straighten out mine. <laughs> you can forget about it. They run you. <laughs> <laughs> and especially the youngest one, but uh, uh, it's it's really uh, it is it's really all about these things. The thread, I mean, that was what's so amazing. Uh, again, it, the work. How how long? Oh, you know. Um, well, when I first found out about her story, I was invited uh, to the Prudence Crandall Museum, and I want to put in a plug for the museum, because as we Great talk place. about this story, yeah. the amazing thing is that her, her schoolhouse stands to this day. Right. It's owned by the state of Connecticut. It's a museum. You can can Canterbury, you can go uh, visit it, and Kaz Kozlowski uh, is the curator there today. She was when I was first elected and invited me to go to the museum, so I did. I heard about her story, was intrigued by it for all the reasons we've talked about. Um, so then I started to do research about it because I thought, well, all right, Prudence Crandall is in my district. Her, her schoolhouse is in my district. I, therefore, I want to know as much as I can, can about it. Right? And it got to a point where um, over time and reading more in different accounts and delving into it, um, I started finding little, little details that I had not seen written down elsewhere. Uh, then I kind of got obsessed by it and realized that, you know, there's a uh, a wide uh, variety of materials at uh, the State Supreme Court Library, all about her trial, but also letters um, and other information. Connecticut College has a repository of information, more letters uh, and documents. And so I started sifting through all this in uh, some of my spare time. And, uh, and there was a tipping point as I was discovering things where I had seen so many different things that had not been written down before that I decided I needed to, to write something. There is another good biography that Susan Strain wrote back in the early 1990s called A Whole-Souled Woman. And I looked at that's a very uh, good account of Prudence Crandall's life. But as I discovered more things that I had not seen there or anywhere else, um, I, I started writing. And it took me about eight years, eight years, because wow. You know, um, I had other things going on. <laughs> this, this was a hobby. This <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. is not my full-time yeah, job. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, by a, a very understanding <laughs> wife, uh, and I'd come home after a long day at the Capitol, and I would be able to kind of uh, uh, go off into this different world of abolitionists for an hour or two uh, and, and, you know, start chipping away at writing one chapter, then a second, then a third. And it's funny, when you write a book, um, one, by the time you get into the fifth or sixth chapter, you go back and look at chapter chapter one and you realize that's terrible. You know, I'm going to have to go, I probably, I probably rewrote chapter one four or five times. That's why I don't write. That's why I don't write. Uh, it, it, it's, uh, uh, but I could tell with the detail and the work and, and I knew, you know, this wasn't a quickie book. This was long researched out and everything else. But again, the threads, 
that run through the book, they drive you into wanting to find out other things. <laughs> I mean, I, I was, I, it was good for me because because I have, uh, my associate and I, uh, okay, he's, uh, he's 47 years in prison, okay? He studies uh, my culture, I studied his culture back and forth, okay? I, uh, when I was very young, I had an integrated group and uh, mixed, we were all, all, all mixed. And uh, one, one of the things he had learned in prison was uh, the Italians and the Irish all had a history. You know, they had a history. You talk about your ancestors and stuff like that. The blacks didn't have a history. I mean, maybe Afro, but mm -hmm. it was about the neighborhood. Now, nobody really, most all of the black community inside, he said, this is crazy. You guys all got a history. So in the 70s, he started programs, uh, Afro-American Teeth, way back in the 70s, about, you know, finding out about culture, where people came from, and stuff like that. And, of course, over the years, we found uh, education for changing individuals who have done the wrong thing and took the wrong path. Ed education is one of the key ways to help you That's get right. out of that, okay? Absolutely. It, is, it is really essential. So when you have no history, though, and you only have the neighborhood, I mean, you're like a lost soul. Mm -hmm. So, of course, he started studying, and then they got Afro, and he developed Afro studies in, in, in uh, Walpole and Norfolk. So, so that's how we got on it. And, of course, you know, he'd say, yeah, did you read this? You know, you need to read about this. I said, I don't need to read about nothing, right? He said, come on, come on. I said, well, if you read, I'll read your stuff, okay? But you need to read about Scotch history. You need to read about this history. Okay, he said, oh yeah, okay, well, that. so we've done it over years. So when I read this, I knew some of the characters that you touched on, the anti-slave people and stuff like that. But this blew my mind, I uh -huh. mean, and, and of course, again, it's written. I mean, we got Mark Twain in this state, you know. <laughs> I love Mark Twain. And, and he appears in this book, and by the way. He does. <laughs> yeah. He makes an appearance. He makes on an appearance. On behalf of Bruden's Crandall, right. actually. <laughs> Don Williams, uh, you, you gotta, you got to read his writing. I mean, uh, he puts you right there. I mean, there's no, well, you Well, like I said, it's, it's, it's a whole picture. Yeah. I mean, the intertwining of relationships yes. over an entire lifetime. Mm. And that's, I mean, that's, that's the, the part of, of her. And I think one of the things that really strikes me about uh, Prudence Crandall, I mean, you're talking about the morality. And um, the, uh, uh, certainly a lot of that was based on uh, 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 spiritual or relig religious beliefs. Yeah. Yeah. Well. She, she, she changed different churches yes. four times throughout her lifetime. Yes, she did. And, yeah. and, 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 and it struck me, she was drawn towards this, this sort of spiritualism um, you know, throughout different points, and I, and I know that's something that that, that that Father and I work from quite frequently. Is you know, yeah, it's, the, it's the, the the spiritual, the spiritual direction, direction. And, and how that really kind of guides you yeah, yeah. Mm. Uh, within this, and you you could just see how that was you know, or, or, or touchstone throughout throughout her life, and how it it guided her in in all different directions, right down to. I mean, she stayed with a with a man that probably wasn't that very nice to her, you know. And they spent time apart and w were together, but um, still that level of of, of loyalty. Mm -hmm. Yeah, she was she was in a, a an unhappy marriage yes. uh, to Calvin Filio, uh, who was a Baptist minister. And Prudence mm -hmm. Crandall was was raised in a Quaker family, um, and then later uh, migrated to the Baptist faith. And when she mm -hmm. was running our her school was baptized uh, in the Quinnebog River uh, in northeastern Connecticut. Um, but she was seeking, I would say, throughout her entire mm -hmm. life. She, a journey, she, right. uh, she was on a journey. Right. She wanted to teach throughout her life, I think because she realized that uh, teaching could be uh, a change agent for folks, that it, that mm -hmm. it gave, as Russ, you were saying, uh, folks power, especially uh, dispossessed. Uh, folks, uh, it, it, it gave you the ability to, to better yourselves and then to help others. Yeah. And that's, that's what she wanted to do. And yes, Dominic, you're right. I think her religious faith absolutely uh, was one of the key things that informed her decisions. Uh, that and then being open to the influence of, of uh, others who were also in some cases spiritual and in other cases people who were abolitionists. Mm -hmm. uh, so you had Samuel May, a Unitarian minister, a very mm -hmm. strong supporter who worked closely with her, William Lloyd Garrison, who 
wasn't quite sure about religion, but but absolutely was fighting for uh, for equality. Equality. Uh, yeah. And uh, and toward the end of her life. Uh, she was involved in a movement called spiritualism, which mm -hmm. uh, believed that you could communicate with spirits mm -hmm. um, after folks, after loved ones uh, died. And we might look back at that today and say, well, you know, people thought they heard knocking sounds and voices of spirits and playing with Ouija board like things, and it seems fairly gimmicky. But you have to remember in, in the uh, late 1800s, when this was popular, folks were learning about astronomy and they were learning about electricity mm -hmm. and they were learning about all these forces in nature and it, it didn't seem like that far of a leap that as you're thinking about electrical right. currents, as you're mm -hmm. thinking about, as you're looking up in the stars and seeing the stars in an entirely different way, that you think to yourself, well, of course, there's, there's got to be some energy left after someone dies. And mm -hmm. isn't it possible to reach out, if we're, if we're through scientific discoveries, finding out all these other pathways, then why wouldn't there be a pathway uh, through spiritualism to contact uh, the departed. So it, it was not so far a stretch uh, yeah. Yeah, to, yeah, for, exactly. for folks to believe. And, and you had not only uh, Prudence Crandall, but William Lloyd Garrison. Um, you had Susan B. Anthony, who was interested in spiritualism. Mm -hmm. uh, Abraham Lincoln, and Lincoln. especially his wife, yeah, Mary. Yeah, there yeah, there yeah, were Lincoln. seances, yeah, spiritualist seances, seances right? held yeah. in the White House yeah, yeah, during yeah. the Lincoln era. Oh, yeah. I, I, I mean, uh, uh, the, well, it, it still goes on today. I mean, it, it's not, it, it, it's a, for some individuals, it still goes on today. Uh, uh, and spiritualism, who's to say? I, I mean, I never, I, know, I never make a judgment on anybody, wherever they are, mm -hmm. whatever they believe and everything else. People say, well, you no, you know, your belief is to yourself, uh, okay? I really believe in, in, in the sense that it's between you and whatever, uh, however you determine that under your own definition. I have mine, other uh, people have theirs, and, and uh, I mean, we we believe I believe I walk in the spirit. I get up and do do certain things and and uh, sometimes he texts you directly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we'll tell that on another show, right? It, it's uh, 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 you know and and, and uh, 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 people. Uh, uh, karma. I don't care whatever you call it. You do right. You 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 learn. People people need to uh, learn to that they are brothers and sisters, mm -hmm. that we all live in this universe. We all, uh, we, we all are connected to one another in some ways. And, and, and uh, I mean, and, and, and this slavery, this abusiveness that goes on is insidious. It's immoral, it's wrong, and we need to talk about it more. We need to, okay, this was then, we need to talk about all those evil things that happened and get it out and, and, and deal with it. And we don't. Putting it away doesn't help anything, as we are seeing in this across the country, uh, okay? I mean, you, you are my brother. Whether, whether you like me or not, <laughs> it's too bad, uh, okay? I am my brother's keeper and my sister's keeper, you, you know? We have to take care of those individuals that cannot take care of themselves. We have to, uh, if we want a quality civilization, we need to lift up those who yeah, you know, and I mean that that's what all this is about. I mm -hmm. mean and, and and you know throughout her life that's what she she, was she wanted she wanted to do, to do because it was it was certainly about lifting up um, the dispossessed and certainly those who were discriminated against. but she later moved to Illinois and then right. lived the last decade of her life out in uh, Elk Falls, Kansas. She continued to teach. She ran mm -hmm. a, 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 an informal school out of out of her home uh, in both places and taught um, the, the children of poor white families mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, who needed an education. So, you know, there was a lot about her story, uh, especially when she was running the schoolhouse and was in communication with the abolitionist leaders in Boston and New York and Providence that reminded me about the civil rights movement in the 1950s and 1960s, where you had this, even though we may think about it today, some people might think, oh, the civil rights movement in the 1960s, that's Martin Luther King, right? That's right. And you say, well, yes, yeah. it's Martin Luther King, but it's also thousands and thousands of other people. Yes, it and, is. and hundreds of, uh, hundreds of leaders who were activists, but then, then thousands of the, the ground troops 
who put themselves out there uh, in marches and in protests uh, and in standing up uh, for equality. And, and, you know, Dominic, you were talking about the, the, all the various characters. It's not just a biography about Prudence no. Crandall. It's not no, one no. person. It was this, this significant group of folks who came together and worked together in a way that we see today, I think, when folks are fighting uh, for equality and for the rights of all. And, 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 that, and that, 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 I guess maybe that's why I loved it so much because you had all these people popping up in there. <laughs> uh, okay, that if you did know the wider spectrum, you realize, hey, this guy's got a book about his own. His, his own life was something else. This person here is somebody else. And all these people come together, all of which have their own stories. And, and, and exactly, that's exactly what happens today. It's the unknown people who, I mean, that's, that, that, that's what maybe is part of the thing that makes me love this so much is uh, there's so many that continue to work, that continue today, that you don't know about. Y mm. y you know what I mean? I, my, my saying is, you can change the mm. world, right? How many do have? Six. With six people, as <laughs> long as what? As long as you don't take the credit for it. <laughs> <laughs> right? As long as you don't take the credit. If you're looking for the credit, see you later. Yeah. <laughs> you, you, you're, in, you're in trouble. But that's what it takes. It takes everybody... You, you know, doing stuff. I mean, we do it with our with my street talk and my mm. my thing. Uh, I mean, I have a bunch of advocates that are, are behind the scenes and everything. And when you need them, and if you really need them, they get up and they do things. And it may be, you know, that's only an hour or two that they could do something, make a phone call, do whatever, go out and vote. You know, mm -hmm. okay. Mm -hmm. But they but they do it. And if you don't want to do it, then you know. <laughs> I don't complain. Right, that's one, right. One of the things that, that really struck me, like, within this, and I, I know we, we've had this discussion uh, uh, about um, precedents and, and, and certainly the, the legal arguments, oh. but certainly um, I think the precedents that she showed in being willing to, to go to the point of being arrested in order to make sure that this, you know, was, was, was brought to trial, um, and then... Um, the, the, the two gentlemen that uh, was Ellsworth and Ellsworth and Calvin Goddard and and the argument the arguments that they made I mean uh, we, we talk about law and most people look back on what laws have been written or, or what arguments have been made but um, the precedent setting that that happened within this case and also um, within um, the the Connecticut Supreme Court that that this could have literally gone up to the Supreme Court had it not been for like uh, them trying to find a way to wiggle out of it. It was or cowardice. It was cowardice. Uh, technicality. Yes. We, 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 we might have had a, a, a different uh, point of view a, a, as to, you know, having the Supreme Court actually having to rule on this prior to the Civil War. If the majority of the state Supreme Court at that time had done what they wanted to do, which yeah. was to rule that the black law was unconstitutional, we'd probably all know their names. We'd probably yeah. all know the, the names of those justices uh, because their names would be written much larger in American history. Mm -hmm. And that would have been a, a decision that would have been appealed to the U.S. Supreme Court. John Marshall was still the, the Supreme Court uh, Chief Justice at that time. Uh, and I make an argument in the book that it would have been unlikely but not out of the realm of possibilities that you would have had a U.S. Supreme Court outcome uh, upholding some form of black citizenship, at least for free blacks, and mm -hmm. which would have opened the door yeah. to um, uh, a recognition of, of civil rights for all so much earlier in American mm -hmm. history. Um, but at minimum, we would have set down a marker. If, if even even if the Supreme Court had dodged that case, or had not ruled, or if they did rule on it, not ruled favorably, the state of Connecticut would have set down a marker saying these kind of laws, that this discriminatory black law is unconstitutional, and that would have been validated by history. But instead, um, the three justices were afraid to take on the chief mm -hmm. justice, who was David Daggett, who was also the lower court, court judge. judge. Unbelievable yep. at this time that yep. uh, how people thought about or didn't think about conflicts of interest. Right. Here was someone who was, as a Supreme Court justice, 
uh, sitting in judgment of his own decision his in own. a lower court. I know, it was amazing, wasn't it? And, and the, other three, the other three associate justices didn't want to embarrass him by overruling mm -hmm. his decision when he was the chief justice of the Connecticut right. State Supreme Court. So they more or less invented a techni technicality right. and decided to throw the case out on this um, invisible technicality. It, 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 it is, like I said, this, 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 all, all attorneys need to <laughs> <laughs> read the book. Uh, 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 and, uh, uh, and my background in law helped me a lot, obviously, when I was looking at the pleadings, trying to find that technicality, looking at the mm -hmm. original docket, the documents at the State Supreme Court Library, and then all of a sudden realizing, uh, I can't believe this. The, the, the technicality that they said was there, I'm not finding. You're not finding. And the, but, but I also have a journalism background, too, so I didn't want to tell the story in a legalistic, inaccessible, mm -hmm. inaccessible dusty, historian kind of way. I wanted to tell it in a way that folks could ideally uh, wrap their, wrap their uh, arms around and, and understand. Well, I, I don't know if you know or not. We, we, I have, we have a... a I'm in partnership with a publisher. We have Little Red Cell, and we publish uh, books from, if they're quality books, from people like that are behind the walls that couldn't afford or couldn't be able to get their voice out. Uh, it's part of the ministry that I do. Um, and, and it's real interesting because I don't want to insult anybody, but you don't write like an attorney. A lawyer's, <laughs> lawyer, lawyer's right no. You know what I mean, That's right? What I, was and and you, yeah, I, I didn't realize that because I was going to ask, you got me, just, I was going to ask you, well, you know, I know you're an attorney, but you don't write like, but it's your journalistic background yeah. that, that is that's okay. Because I was trying to figure out, because I did know that you were an attorney, and obviously with the legal background, I'm saying, but, you know, <laughs> journalists are not authors. Well, right? you want to, you know, first... And I mean, I, attorneys are not authors most, most of the time. Right, just, I mean... Uh, Historic, a lot of historians I'm in awe of, and even though I took a lot of, of history classes in college, I don't profess to be a historian, I'll, and I'll, there are some just tremendous books about this era uh, that you know, I use as touchstones and that are cited throughout uh, the, the footnotes. Uh, but attor attorneys, yes, they, we, we have a, 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 pa a passion sometimes for writing in very dense ways. <laughs> Incomprehensible. Yeah, exactly. Uh, right. So, uh, so I wanted to tell uh, that side of the story, but that's when I had to really rely on that journalism background and remind myself, you know, don't get way into the weeds here. Tell the story and explain it in a way that can connect with folks. And I, I hope, you know, I, I hope I succeeded, especially in those legal aspects. Well, of the well I think you did, and I, I mean, obviously, I, I want to make, I want to make sure that I, I, our people, our people get out there and read this book. This is a nice read. This is really a nice read. This is a great book to read. It, it, it's a good book. I nurtured it because I didn't want to end it quick. I <laughs> slowed it down because I love the writing. Uh, okay, so it's, it, it is a story. I mean, you can get right into the movie aspect in your head by the way you wrote this, okay? Uh, okay, and a lot of books you can't do. I just, I just finished uh, The Great Reformer on, on Pope Francis, right? Wonderful book, wonderful book. Everybody should read that book, too. However, it was exhausting. Mm -hmm. It was so detailed and stuff like that. It was an exhausting read. But, but if you want to know about the Pope, who he is, and what he's about, that's a book to read. This, this was a joy. It was, it was really a, a, a nice read and a joy to read. And you're getting all this serious, serious well, stuff. Some, some parts in the story are just... Yeah. I mean, blew my mind. I mean, the last <laughs> chapters, when you're talking about Brown versus Board of Ed, and I'm, certainly I didn't know any of this, the, the Chief Justice passed away. Frederick Vincent, yes. <laughs> right, right before. Right I mean, in the middle of the case. Right really. in the middle of this case. Yeah. And, and, and Eisenhower uh, uh, appoints Earl Warren. A Republican governor from California who'd never been a judge before. Uh, uh, onto this case. Yeah. And it, w it was looking like uh, Judge Vincent was probably going in the opposite direction. And he could have been the fifth vote against uh, overruling segregation. In other words, for upholding segregation. And that, according to William O. Douglas, when they did the quick uh, vote after the initial arguments, it was five to four in favor of upholding segregation. 
So you're right. You're right. Then, then Judge Vincent, ha Vincent had a heart attack. <laughs> <laughs> That's just amazing, and and then it, uh, what the, what Earl Warren did within that, as 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 a as a, le a legislator, uh, yeah. to be able to pull those people together, and he wanted a, a unanimous decision right. to be able to really, you know, set the marker set down the and marker. say that this is the direction that we need to go morally. I mean, yeah. Uh, that was just, I mean, I, I finally read the last chapter two days ago. <laughs> the only time I can read is when my five-year-old is like asleep. So I'm up at like 2.30 in the morning actually reading this to make sure I got through it. And I was just like in shock. Yeah. I didn't know any of this stuff. Yeah, it, p people, we, we might think that it was just the inevitable arc of history that, of course, uh, segregation would be overruled. And too bad that it took uh, up to 1954 to get it done. but. You delve into that case and you realize it was a close call. That, uh, matter of fact, when they had that initial 5-4 vote, the four justices who were in the minority at that time who wanted to strike down segregation were shocked and sort of terrified the idea that there might be a decision to uphold segregation and argued persuasively for a do-over which the Supreme Court hardly ever does, which is, you know what, why don't we come back in a few months and let the parties argue <laughs> the case all, all over, over again. again. Right. But this yeah. time, don't give us the social science ev evidence. That, that doesn't give us a constitutional basis to strike down segregation. This time, argue the 14th Amendment. And that's where the, the Prudence Grandel case uh, had some influence. It's, it's, it is amazing stuff. I mean, it really, it really is amazing stuff, and it really is. The timeline isn't that far away. I mean, that, I, I mean, this is the this is one of the most difficult things in our country. Is this is not taught? This is not talked enough about. We don't discuss this enough. Uh, okay, in the ins and outs and all this stuff, we just we don't do it. And by not doing it, we continue the immorality that goes on. 13th Amendment still holds slavery. Uh, 13th Amendment, uh, everybody says, oh, well, slavery is over. No, it ain't. All you got to do is read the 13th Amendment. You get a felony charge, you become a slave. We just changed ownership from private to state. Okay, now I had an ancestor relative that said, no, you can't do that. Nobody should be allowed to own people. Even in cases of war, okay, you have no right. You can incarcerate and stuff like that, but you can't. Servitude is not, is immoral. And, 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 and we still have it. We, we, we still have it. An, an amendment. We fight from that from the justice standpoint, uh, okay, to, to this very day. Uh, okay, that if you are convicted of a crime, it's the only way you can have slaves. Mm. Uh, yeah, and a lot of people don't read it. They don't know their 13th Amendment. Well, I happen to because of <laughs> it. It made me go back and actually, and I did read through all the amendments. <laughs> <laughs> and, 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 and how amendments, um, some of them are still held open. There, there's uh, the, the Corwin Amendment, is, is, uh, which was for segregation, obviously, and, and, and slavery back in, I think it was 1850 or somewhere in around there. Is, is, some of these amendments are, are, are still, you know, that they've tried to put through are still held open because there was no date tied to them. Strangely <laughs> enough. <laughs> well, luckily, the 14th and the and yes. 15th Amendment control. Yes. As we knew it. Uh, right, right, right. No one would argue that. No one would argue that. But that's why I said I'm reading through this. I'm looking at what amendments have, have been proposed. You don't and, know. And I'm just, you know, flab flabbergasted. Yeah. You know, it's some of them that are, that, that are, still, are still held open because there was no, no date. Unlike other things that, you know, you talk about Prudence Crandall, um, the, the, the Equal Rights Amendment mm. didn't pass. And, 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 I mean, to look at, look at somebody like her, I, I, I guess I can't understand why this hasn't, you know, been brought up to try another time uh, again within our society. Well, she was a fighter for equal rights for, mm -hmm. for all, and, and especially women as well. And when you think about it, you know, when she was being persecuted and she had admitted Sarah Harris and was mm -hmm. teaching other black women at her school, um, they held town meetings in the town of Canterbury to pass resolutions against her school. Now, when they did that, because she was a woman, 
she could not attend and defend herself. Nope. She could not yeah, speak man, know, in public. Because not, not yeah. only could women not <laughs> vote, I know. I know. They, they, they couldn't vote until 1919, but, right. uh, but they could not speak in public at, at meetings. And she was part of another movement, the Temperance Movement, yeah, which right. was uh, out to eradicate alcohol and the evils of alcohol. It was a, a movement largely driven, not exclusively driven, but largely driven by women. Oh. Businessmen became very interested, too, because they didn't want drunken workforces. But the majority of folks uh, with a temp within the temperance societies were women. When they held their public meetings, the only folks who could speak were men at the public meetings. Yes. Uh, such was the state of inequality. And what's fascinating to me is, is today, even though we have made tremendous progress, mm -hmm. and I think we all have to agree that, that, that the, the progress of America, as I like to say when I have these book discussions, I believe the progress of America uh, can be measured by the success we've had in the fight for equality over time. And, and we have had tremendous success. And yet, we still can't today say that uh, every issue regarding equality is over regarding people of color. We can't say it's over regarding women. Uh, and there are new frontiers, gay and lesbian rights. Yeah. So, mm -hmm. so the, 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 the quest for true equality in America goes on. But I think if you look at some of the best chapters in the history of this country, it's when we took steps forward to guarantee opportunity and equality for all. And it is a struggle that continues. And it, 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 it is, and, and uh, you know what, I'm watching my time, I can't believe <laughs> this show is almost over. I, I was so glad to have you on the show. I mean, really, uh, and again, it, the book is fabulous. We know the struggle goes on. Mm -hmm. yeah, we're all in it. Everybody yep. at this table are all in it, and we'll continue uh, to do it. I'm going to love to have you back if I can ever get you we're back we're on love, here love to do that. And, and talk about it. And of course, to my audience, we're going to continue. We're going to talk. I'm going to talk about how the Irish became white, okay, which comes around the same time as this was going on, and and, and, and will be discussed in some of our other shows. And and I we hope that you all enjoy this, Dominic. Uh, we got a. We got a. We come back at eight o'clock. Oh, <laughs> Kathy Austin. Yeah, so yeah, we yeah, have dinner and yeah, come yeah, back. Yeah, 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 <laughs> we're going to relax at that point. <laughs> <laughs> well, we got a lot of good shows yes. coming out, right? Yes. Uh, okay, we got uh, next week. Uh, next week we got Representative uh, McGee. Uh, McGee's going to be here next yeah, week to, to, to discuss uh, race relations. Race relations, yeah. right? Yeah. Right, and then. Uh, we got uh, my, 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 my boxing trainer. We're going to be talking about <laughs> boxing, right? right? So, look, we, we've got about six weeks of great shows coming up. Please follow us. Dawn, God uh, bless you. I am you, so happy incredible. that you are so an incredible, incredible, you incredible you. book. Listen, okay? I'm telling you. <laughs> Go get this book. I've been, I, it should be a movie, okay? Wahlberg's. You know, I know you all. Get on it. Get this book. Get to, um, <laughs> to make a movie. Okay? Yeah, I know the Wahlbergs. They're Boston boys. You ought to know that, right? <laughs> God bless. We love you. See you next week.